Old Testament history contains information of great value for the teacher of biblical religion. In this part of scripture, he finds the story of a people whom God chose as his own, to whom he gave his holy law, to whom he revealed an ever reoccurring and constantly clarified prophecies, the Messiah, the Redeemer of lost mankind. From generation to generation, they saw ever more clearly the nature and the work of the God-man who was to bring back to the Heavenly Father the people estranged through the fall. Teachers of biblical history learn with interest the many and varied rituals and rites and sacraments that served Israel as a constant reminder of the redemption and salvation to come and as divinely instituted means to engender and strengthen their faith in the promised Redeemer. Through the words of prophecy Israel saw, even though darkly, the glory of the New Testament church. To them, the Messiah was a reality, even though they had but a promise of his appearance. Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken. I'm your host, Zelwyn Heidi, coming to you today without Willie. He had to be out today, but joining me today is the Reverend Aaron Uphoff, whom we finally managed to track down again. <laughs> And to, to talk to us today about uh, using biblical histories in catechesis and confirmation. So, Aaron, how are you? I'm doing great. I really only came on the show to prove that I was not a Nadia Boltz Weber sock account, <laughs> and also that I'm not a collective hallucination of the members of Word Fitly Spoken and their audience. I don't know. This might be one giant deep fake for all we know, but continue. <laughs> I'm actually Willie with a voice modulator. That's that's what's going on here. Uh, how's the weather out in New Jersey? New Jersey's nice, a little humid. We had a lot of rain, especially this morning where it was just pouring down. I was up at 6 a.m. with my cup of coffee with the window open and just listening to it. It was It was nice, but it's made for a pretty humid afternoon. So we had to flip the air conditioning on over here at the church. Sure. Yeah, things are starting to warm up a little bit over here. We've had an unusually cool June so far, but a lot more rain than we've been having in the past couple of years. So that's been a blessing in itself. Tomatoes are kind of slow in coming up, but hopefully the, the heat will kick in a little bit and get them get them rolling again. Right. Do you have a garden? Uh, we, we do. My wife does most of it. I want to get more into it myself. But as it stands, I've been working more on setting up the woodworking shop and and using that as an excuse to stay inside where the temperature is nice and <laughs> and the humidity is low. Hey, that's that's a that's a good hobby though. That's a good thing to do with working with your hands that way. My dad's a farmer over in Illinois, not too far from where Willie is, and this was one of the latest planting seasons we had over there. The the rain hmm. kept them out of the field forever and once it did stop enough for them, long enough for them to plant, they had to pray for it again because <laughs> the ground started to get hard. That's how these things go. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Well, uh, we should probably jump into our topic here. So let's start with this. First of all, what, Aaron, what do we mean by a biblical history? What do we mean by Bible histories in general? Sure. Well, I'm not uh, too well versed in the history of using Bible histories for Lutherans before the 20th century, but I know a little bit. I know that I do do know that they have a, a practice and a precedent back before we switched to English and that it was part of Lutheran day school curriculums, uh, that we didn't just teach the catechism and have the kids memorize the catechism and the catechism explanation, but that we taught them from Bible histories. And these were books that were published through our synod and other synods, of course, had them in their own versions of them. And they were, they are essentially summary books of key stories in the Bible laid out, you know, with lesson numbers from Genesis all the way to the end of the New Testament with the design that these core stories be taught in these curriculum, whether in the school or in part of even confirmation curriculum. And so to say a Bible history is a specific type of book that fits all of the, these criteria, has other supplemental books, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well. So what would be the benefit of using this kind of book? Why couldn't you just say, just start in the Bible and go forward? You know, why, why would someone want to pick up this kind of book? Bible histories are a succinct summary of the stories themselves and even the overall narrative of Scripture. You know, the Bible 
is an important book, obviously, and it is something that people should read and use on their own. And really using Bible histories and class and confirmation curriculum has the end goal, not just with the students know the stories, but develop a taste for, for the stories enough to where they would read the Bible on their own. But the history itself, using a history, gives a summary. It also provides the opportunity to be on a common curriculum with other folks in the Synod or other Lutheran churches that are using Bible history. So there's this core corpus of stories that you know that your students and other students are going to know well. Also, that Bible histories provide the stories laid out in a succinct way that is ready for class. So uh, they're not just summaries of the stories, but they provide an outline that's ready to be picked up and used right away where you don't have to reinvent the wheel in your study trying to decide, you know, which you know version of a story do I use or which details do I keep in or out? You just stick with what the, the Bible history has provided you. Yeah, so the, the time saving and also the common curriculum I are definitely very good things to, to promote and to suggest using this to to our listeners. Now that we have an idea of why one might use it, what would you say is the the benefit of using a Bible history? Well, first of all, let me say this. I think I'll, I'll be so bold as to say, I think that Lutheran pastors should revise their confirmation curriculum to include Bible histories or their own version of it. I'll even be so broad as to say, if you, you can't quite stomach <laughs> the books, just using using the Bible and doing it yourself, that's fine too. But confirmation needs to include going through the Bible and its stories. Three reasons in my mind, at least. Uh, the, first of all, the Bible is history. It is not just stories or pious stories or, you know, whatever the higher critics say that it is put together. We made them up. But no, this is what actually happened. This is the story of God's world and his people in that world. So that is worth covering. It's also God's word itself. It's, it's, it's what happened. It's the history, but it's God's word. And so as God's word, we should take the time to learn what it has to say, to learn what these stories are. And of course, the third point is that the Bible is history or using the Bible history, it teaches and illustrates doctrine and life to us. It helps us to know what it is we believe as Christians and how it is that we are supposed to live as Christians. And learning the stories from the Bible and its narrative and how it all fits together helps us to do that. Sure. So let's let's unpack your three points a little bit here. Okay. When you're saying like the Bible is history, why would it be beneficial to emphasize to our confirmation students that what they're reading is actually history, is actually something that has happened in a real time and place. What would be the benefit of that? Yeah, I think if you think about it, if we're not teaching this, who is? Okay. And that's regardless of the school setting. I mean, you know, a good homeschool parent is going to, who's a Christian is going to include something like this, maybe, you know, a, a textbook of some sort, or they'll just be really good at reading the Bible. And that's great. And And I would hope that our Lutheran schools at least have some form of this or teaching (laughs) what happened in the Bible to their students. I can't imagine it not being the case, but these days you never know. (laughs) But but you know, as well as I do, that public schools are not going to teach this, teach what happened, especially in the Old Testament, as having happened. And, you know, insofar as they teach, you know, the New Testament, they would just simply teach that Jesus was a historical figure and say something like, and his followers believe that he was risen from the dead. But none of it will be presented in a factual way. So we're really the only ones to do this. And secular history, they control the narrative pretty much for the most part in public schools. And so there's this big vacuum. and, And if they do cover this period, it's done purely from I'm not sure what the the academic name for it is, but just the the modern academy's view of of what happened during this time and and maybe they'll they'll heighten other cultures and their you know mythical stories about origins or they'll go the the geological route and just talk about the supposed millions of years the earth has been around but that's right. that's the history they're getting as it is, so it's up to us to provide it as pastors to our flocks. Well, I think it's also important because so often when the Bible is presented, even among well-meaning Christians, we sort of present the Bible as almost just as stories, Mm -hmm. as something that just, you know, we can learn something from and, you know, we can talk about it, but that's all we ever really think about it. A few weeks ago, we had on here 
Dr. Andrew Steinman talking about biblical chronology during his segment and how you can, when you actually are able to put like actual dates to some of the things that happened in the Bible, like, you know, Abraham lived at this date or whenever these things happened, that actually helps to see what's going on here as being actually in time and actually in a real corner of history. It's not just a story. Right. And, and it, I would even say that that helps to make the story alive, you know, so to speak. And, right. you know, this, this is family history. Okay. When you think of the church as being God's chosen, his family, his own body, really, the body of Christ, that this is our story too, from when Adam and Eve first believed the promise onward. It should go without saying, but it, we have to say it, that a lot of people, are, 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 that we need to know our history. We need to know who we are and where we have come from. And the, the example I was thinking of with this, and this is this is a personal one, I was shamed a few years ago, just, just giving it some thought that I knew more about Star Wars in the Star Wars universe, or about <laughs> Lord of the Rings and you know Tolkien's Middle Earth, and, and the, the peoples and the narratives and all that stuff that I knew about the period of the divided kingdom in Israel. You know, I, I knew that the division happened. I could pick out a few king's names and, you know, obviously a few of the key stories that I might have remembered from Sunday school growing up. But I had a pretty weak grasp of that. So it's like, well, if this is true, this is our story, which uh, both of those are, are the case. We ought to dive into it as if as if it is at least as important as Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. No, as if it's more important than Star Wars <laughs> and Lord of the Rings. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, of course, people can have their own hobbies. And that's not saying that, you know, we can't know something about these different, like you say, uh, Lord of the Rings or whatever the case might be. Right, correct. Yeah. We don't want to lose the sci-fi and Tolkien portion of our audience. <laughs> well, I I enjoy Tolkien a great deal, but your point is well made that if I know more about Tolkien and even like the obscure parts of Tolkien, but I'm not able to even tell you the basic outline of the Bible, there's a problem there. Mm -hmm. You know, there there is something that needs to be rectified. So I think both things can be true. You can enjoy enjoy Tolkien on your time off, but make sure that you also know what it is that the Bible actually says. Right. But so to, to your second point, then, when you say that the Bible is God's word, why, why is that important to emphasize as well? If this is the inspired word of God, which we believe it to be, it should go with that, that it is important to know. Like, we shouldn't have this belief that this book and all that's in it, its stories, its doctrines, is inspired by the creator of the universe, and then proceed to learn nothing about it or its contents. Sure. Again, that should go without saying, but we have to say it. I think you meet a lot of people where they have maybe vague recollections of, of Bible stories. And you can understand maybe once in a while, like mixing up Elijah and Elisha, but not really being certain if Noah lived before Moses or vice versa, stuff like that. And really you sort of discover that practically they're Lutheran or Christian, Christian in general, Lutheran in particular, more on authority than on having actually gone into the scriptures and seen for themselves and known the doctrine and what God's word has to say. Yeah, so often when you encounter people, especially in, in this time, although I think it's always been a problem in, throughout the whole history of the church, but especially in these days, people will have, well-meaning Christians will have very high regard for the Bible, but they have very little idea of what's actually in the Bible. And so they have this this, you know, this is God's word, I believe it. And then they say something like, well, I don't ever remember reading that. Yeah, it, well, I'll, I'll do another admission. I feel it's always cathartic to come on word fitly because I end up confessing my <laughs> sins to our audience. But there was, there was a, when, when I, well, I'll just give a little background. I think I, I came into the Missouri Synod in college and some of the first books I read were on Seminex. And I was just so impressed that there was this church body where the higher critics didn't win. Sure. At least not outright. I mean, we still have troubles with it here and there, but you know, the Bible maintained its authority and our confession of the same remained intact. And I was all about it. And so I would read about inerrancy and stuff without really reading the Bible as much as I should. You know, so I, I believed in verbal inspiration, as I still do. And I could talk about that at length. But again, you know, those weak spots of, of just the story itself and forgetting, you know, what where what books were and what was in those books and the like. And it's got to be more, you know, to, to be an errantist, it has to be more than Seminex bad. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm I thank God I'm not like those other people over there. You know that we don't want our Christian confession to be simply that of the of the Pharisee and, and not that of the publican. To Very use, good. To use a biblical example. Well, with just just a few minutes left in this section, then we'll talk about your third point when you're saying that a Bible history also teaches or illustrates doctrine and life. What do you mean by that? And and can you give some examples? Yeah, so we, we do learn the catechism, which is important and it's good and necessary. But sometimes, if we just look at the catechism without the Bible stories, which is the catechism verses and the proof texts, without Bible stories to to back it up, it just sort of seems like it's a a, a rules list. Like these are all the things you got to believe. These are all the things you got to do. Like a like a long terms and conditions that the kids just try and get through so they can make their parents happy that they got confirmed or something like that. You know, they, they, there's those. What's the perennial? complaint from people for perhaps the new pastors more than more experienced ones that the sermons are more doctrinal and they don't have enough illustrations or stories in them, which will leave that up to the listeners to debate whether that's a valid critique or not. But well, if people want stories though, what better place to go than the Bible to give those stories, to use illustrations? There's a book of John Gerhardt's sermons, Johann Gerhardt, and in these sermons on the, the historic lectionary, the one-year lectionary, he usually provides at the outset of the sermon an Old Testament story which illustrates the doctrine or the point that he's going to be talking about. That in order for the doctrinal point that he'll be preaching on, he uses a Bible story to lead into it and to provide the illustration for people as they go along. And I think that that can help our students today even using these stories to as we teach the catechism and its doctrines to drive it home and give it some application in their minds and something to help remember the doctrine with. You, you can't really underestimate the power and the effectiveness of a good illustration. I mean, we when we did our segment a little while back on Walter A. Meyer, one of his the high points of his preaching were the very powerful illustrations that he used. But I do know from experience and also in, in Meyer and other preachers that when you're able to connect the Bible in that way, to use the Bible itself as the illustration, that can very powerfully make your point in the way that God actually intends the point to be made. Because these aren't this isn't just a history with, you know, some doctrines mixed in. This is God working for his people, through his people, even when his people sin and rebel against him. And so having the examples from the Bible itself really drives home the point that the Holy Spirit is trying to make. So, Absolutely. Well, we're going to go into our first break, so we'll be right back with more Word Fitly Spoken. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. Hang tight. We'll be right back with more Word Fitly. Welcome back to A Word Fitly Spoken. I'm your host, Selwyn Heidi, talking today with Aaron Uphoff on the importance of learning biblical history through the use of Bible histories in confirmation and in catechesis. So we left off our previous discussion about the benefits of using a Bible history. And really, what we're trying to emphasize through this is that the goal of all of this is biblical literacy. This is something that we've covered kind of in the previous section as well, but I think it's worth emphasizing again. Why should we seek biblical literacy, especially in a time when you can just type something into Google and find it, right? Why do we need to know what's in the Bible, Aaron? 
Yeah, if we don't know what's in the Bible, if we're not believing what it teaches us, we're going to believe other things contrary to it. So it's like a vacuum. If the demon's cast out of the person and it returns with seven worse than it was before. The second state or the last state is worse than the first state. To know God's word is an essential part of being a Christian. We can't be Christians and just sort of remain in ignorance about how we, who we are, who God is, and what God has done in and for us. Why couldn't we just pick up the Bible and just go on our own? Could we do that? Or is there still a great benefit in using these kind of secondary resources? Sure. Well, I think of it this way. I mean, no, none of us who were raised inside of the church did it that way. We didn't learn Christianity that way. We learned it from our parents at home telling us, giving us a structural, not even a structural, but a summary of what Christianity was. You know, that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is God's Son who died on the cross to take away our sins and rose again for us so that we may rise and live with him forever. You know, we all learn variations of that fundamental truth from our parents, Sunday school teachers and pastors. So if you think about it, that's like a, its own in its own version of a, a catechism. So uh, catechisms are something, uh, a resource besides the Bible, someone's summary of what it says already in use for pretty much everybody of every denomination all these things are doing is just taking it and writing it down, publishing it in a concise and systematic manner. Yeah, or or we say with the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, how can I understand what's being said unless someone teaches me, unless someone guides me? There is a, a benefit in having a guide through the Bible because it, it can be a somewhat complex and somewhat overwhelming book, if only because it covers such a tremendous amount of time. That's not to say that it's unclear. The Bible is perfectly clear and anyone can understand it, but yet our knowledge is deficient. And so having a guide to lead us through the Bible is something that is definitely going to help us as, as we learn about what God wants to teach us. Right. We all learn from teachers. Books are our teachers just as well as people are. If we're dealing with these kinds of resources and these kind of secondary Bible histories that would teach us something about the Bible and about the outline of the Bible, what kind of resources do we have available to us? Sure. Well, you have the primary texts as far as just the Bible histories themselves go. That you know, There's the older one that I'm thinking of, an advanced Bible history by A.C. Stellhorn, and its modern updated version of it, now published by CPH Concordia's Bible History. And those are the actual primary texts, the, the Bible histories that we're speaking of. There's some supplementary stuff here, too, but we can talk about that in a little bit. So let's deal with the advanced Bible history, which kind of has a, a bit of a daunting title to it, doesn't it? By A.C. Stellhorn. What is that book? You know, who is A.C. Stellhorn? You know, basically tell us something about that, that resource. Well, I, I hate to say I'm pre not prepared enough to know exactly who Stellhorn was, apart from he was a Missouri Synod clergy person. Fair enough. <laughs> but he obviously lived in the earliest part of the 20th century because his book was published in 1936. And I think even it was an update of previous materials that had been in use beforehand. Like I said earlier in the first section, Bible histories are not a new thing to the Missouri Synod, but are an old thing and something that we've had back to the German days. Yeah, Stellhorn's version of advanced Bible history, it is, it's not advanced in the sense that our listeners might be thinking, you know, you think advanced and you're thinking a 500 page textbook or something like that. Now, his is advanced, I think, in contrast to simpler study or simpler summaries of the stories that might be more appropriate for, for little kids. But it's, it's certainly something that is within grasping for the grade school, middle, middle school age of students. Do you happen to know what prompted him to update the book like he did, since you said it was an updating of previous material? Like, what what made it different from what came before? Yeah, so I, I remember the name of the updated work, the work that Stellhorn was updating. It's called Comprehensive Bible History, which I think was published around 1918. But Stellhorn's updated version just changes a bit of the chronology, straightens out some stuff where it might have been confusing he also provides some new illustrations to be used because it has some pictures in it. Every story doesn't have a picture, but some of them do formatting issues and catechism references too, which is, is a key point, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. 
So in, in other words, it's not like he's presenting an all new kind of thing. He's really just kind of updating what he had received. Right. Yeah. I guess I didn't make that clear earlier. Stellhorn didn't invent the Bible history. His is just okay. the one that I have in front of me and that I use chiefly in addition to the new one for my own confirmation class years for Old Testament and New Testament. But from what I understand, Concordia Publishing House has also produced an updated version of that book. Is that correct? Yep. And it more or less does the same thing that Stellhorn did, just you know, takes it a little further, adds a few different illustrations. I think that these ones in the, in the Concordia version are more modern pictures. So there's more smiling going on and hugging. <laughs> I say that tongue in cheek, but it is true. I guess you got to make everybody really friendly. But no, I mean, it, it, it's a good resource. And I actually do use the updated 2000, whatever year this was published, one for my own classes, just because it of uh, the language being updated. I'm not against the Jacobian English, but when you have younger students, it can bog you down a little bit. Even that doesn't use too much, but does with the catechism references. So, And you said you use these th this resource in your classes as well? Is that like a supplemental thing or do you base like majority of your confirmation around like how how big of a part does this play in your catechesis? Sure. Yeah. I, so what I do here is three years of uh, catechesis and it's one year Bible history, Old Testament, one year Bible history, New Testament and one year the small catechism and explanation. And by the way, I do that and it's always the same Everybody's always the same year. So if some, someone can start, it's designed the way I do it to where someone can join midstream, as it were. They don't have to wait until the three-year cycle's done to go right. in and start with the Old Testament. They can join in the New Testament year or join in even the catechism year. You do your best to, in the classes to tie things in because some of the students have had some of the material already that you're covering. Like with, with uh, this year, we just got done with the catechism year. And so my two students that are going to be confirmed here shortly knew all the Bible stories, but we had one student who just started this year. So he knew the catechism, but he didn't know the Bible stories. So when I would come to an illustration point from the catechism, I would have one of the two students that had done the Bible history already give the summary of the story and you know, tell the student, you know, we'll be covering this in the future years. And when we get to the Bible history, I'll be able to ask him questions saying, all right, which part of the catechism, which we covered last year, does this tie into? I think that's a point worth making because sometimes you'd think that having, you know, a huge structured outline, you would have to start at 101. But yeah, this this isn't really meant to be like a, uh, I mean, as, as you put it, like a, you can only start on this date and then you have to wait until the next cutoff date. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. And this would be something beneficial even for someone who's not in confirmation to be able to go through and to work through these stories and to have a better familiarity with the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. We're talking about it in the context of a confirmation class or, but no, this is, this is a useful resource for anybody. Uh, the adult who, even though reads his own Bible, but uh, still maybe has trouble with keeping the chronology and some of the lessons of, of what the stories are teaching us straight in his head can go and read these books as, as a primer and guide to him while he, while he reads the Bible, in addition to it, um, not not in place of it, but in addition to it. Like, again, it's a resource to help us better appreciate and learn what is in the scriptures. And it might also be beneficial because these resources are really not that expensive either. You know, some of the, the bigger chronologies of the Bible, some of the more detailed things, they're going to always, almost always be, you know, quite a bit more expensive. For example, Steinman's book ends is very expensive and unfortunately kind of prohibitively so. But something like this, which gives much of the same detail and kind of ties everything together, is actually relatively affordable. So I, I would encourage anyone who's interested in this to definitely to look into these works. Right. Well, very good. Now, I know that you had mentioned that there were other resources available, Aaron, that kind of help with these Bible histories and kind of supplement the material. So do you want to talk about those resources and, you know, what else, you know, why one might be interested in having this material at all? Yeah, absolutely. So it all goes together. It's like a package deal. But since the older ones, only the Bible history itself has been updated. I'm not aware of CPH publishing updated versions of the other things I have. You kind of have to find them all on your own, but you can you can figure out how to use them together. The The chief two resources that I'm thinking of and that I use are uh, Bible History References. Okay, Bible His History References was also published, I think, it, around the mid-century. 
And oh boy, I got to look. The guy's name who did this was F. Ruprecht. And again, I don't know much about the guy, but I think Missouri Synod pastor of some sort. And also you have the Bible History Outlines by William Kramer, published in the late 30s. And these are companion volumes to the Advanced Bible History. And they are meant to be used by the teacher in preparing the classes or the lessons for the students, or even the students, at least the the references one, in getting more details about the story. So the Bible history tells the story, the Bible story in two or three pages with subheadings in a succinct summary you know, fashion. So things like the Jesus's discourse in the upper room in John's gospel, that obviously is abridged for the Bible history because you know it wouldn't be a summary if it just had the whole thing. So it hits the high points and other stories too, where all the big dialogues or speeches or sermons or whatever aren't given in their entirety, entirety, but just the the hot points, as it were. So what the Bible history references does is it takes certain words or sentences and provides sort of like a dictionary definition for what's being talked about. For a given story, it might list something like a city. And, you know, so the person just reading the story in the Bible history, they, they're probably not going to know where Tyre and Sidon is unless the, the teacher spent some time on geography. But the Bible history references gives you a description of where that city is and says, you know, you know what part of Canaan or, you know, uh, Israel it was located in. Or it gives maybe the, the definition of a person's name. And for some things, when it talks about the action that was done, it explains it in a catechetical way, like it references the catechism about the particular doctrine that's being displayed in that certain story. And now the Bible history does that too. It also ties in at the end of the story, just lists what commandment, for instance, or maybe part of the Lord's Prayer or article of the Creed can be brought into the story. And often it also has maybe a few Bible verses that also coincide with the theme of the story, and sometimes even hymns as well. The older books, of course, reference the older hymnals. I think the the hymnal before TLH was Evangelical Lutheran Hymnody or something like that. I I can't remember. And if that's wrong, someone's someone's, uh, freaking out right now. Actually, (laughs) isn't Evangelical Lutheran Hymnody, isn't that the ELS hymnal? Uh, it, it it doesn't matter. It Stop. doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> as Willie says, save your angry letters. <laughs> Whatever the, the the Missouri Senate hymnal was before TLH, like so, it references those hymns, and like of course the new one references LSB. But yeah, no. So you have the references. The other one is the Bible history outlines, which that one it provides very good summaries of how to do a class. So if you're going to teach this class and you're going to use the Bible history. This is a great resource to use for your lesson plan. How are you going to structure what you're going to say? You know, like, so for instance, it gives like number, you give the central thought, then it gives you the option of doing a devotion with a a Bible verse reference to be referenced during the devotion that may, you know, has probably nothing to do with the actual story you're telling, but just fits with the theme. And it gives you the approach tying in the commandments or the parts of the catechism, which are touched upon in the story. It even gives you a transition which, you know, for instance, we'll talk about here in the third segment uh, using Naboth's Vineyard as an example. It says, tell the story, discuss the story with the students, and then provide a summary of the story by asking the students questions and encourages you then to close with a hymn and give whatever homework assignment you're going to do. And it does this, you know, that's not just the outline for everyone. It does this specifically for each story in the Bible history. So, if you're going to use this, whether you're teaching at home your own kids, you're teaching your confirmation students or whoever, wherever, this has it all laid out for you. You don't really have to do too much work beyond it. And are there other resources available that one might use, like in addition to these books? Yeah, sure. I do try and use atlases as well. The ESV Concise Bible Atlas by David Barrett, which you can find I think, through Crossway Publishers, that's that's a great resource which gives you all the different maps in and around the Holy Land that are relevant to stories of the in the Bible. Do, do you have anything to say about atlases, Ellen? I know from personal experience the great value of having an atlas, even with like adult classes or just even for your own personal study, because you know to say like Tyre and Sidon as you mentioned before, is one thing, you know, say, okay, they're cities, you know, maybe they're important cities, whatever. But if you don't really have a clear idea of where they are, then sometimes some of the, you know, when they're referenced, you know, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense. But when you know that, for example, that they are 
two uh, coastal cities kind of further north from Israel in the heartland of Phoenicia. That really kind of brings to life the, the, these two cities and their importance and why they, they interact in the way that they do. Or another, another great example of this is like in the book of Amos, when he's opening up, you know, for three transgressions and for four of this area, and then three transgressions and four of this area. This list doesn't make a whole lot of sense until you can see on a map that what he's doing is he's kind of circling around Israel. And mm. he's, kind of, he's kind of moving around in a circle until he finally brings it home when he finally gets down to for three transgressions and for four of Israel, I will not, you know, you know I will do these things. So that, that being able to see in a visual sense can also bring to life the, the various stories of the Bible as well. And and it, it helps it just to because, again, these names are difficult for a lot of people and they're not everyday names. You know, you know, you know where Chicago is or Los Angeles or New York, but uh, any 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 given name in, in the Old or New Testament, unless you've you've read them and spent time there, you don't you don't really know. I mean, we, we take for granted as pastors you know, where Egypt is and the Nile or something like that. But right. our students don't know uh, generally unless we're the ones that teach them. So right. atlases are a good help and maps. Another another resource that I do use to supplement this is a book called The Treasury of Bible Illustrations, Old and New Testaments by Julius Schnorr von Karelsfeld. Uh, He's a fellow who lived back in the 19th century, I believe, and it's just a collection of of woodcuts from of Bible stories. Not all, it doesn't since it's not CPH, it doesn't correspond with these books. So some stories aren't in there, some are. But it's a great way to to illustrate to the students what the story that they've just heard and to help visualize it, too. I mean, we obviously live in an age where the visual is elevated for better or for worse. So using a picture, a painting, a drawing, a woodcut can can help to, again, keep the students engaged in the story you're telling. Well, with that, we're going to take our second break. So we'll be right back with more Word Fitly Spoken. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. The mission of Word Fitly Spoken is to put the Word of God at the center of all of life. To find out more, check us out at wordfitlyspoken.org. Welcome back to A Word Fitly Spoken. Zelwyn Heidi, Aaron Apoff, talking about Bible histories. So we've been talking about Bible histories in general and kind of the benefits of them and, you know, how, the kind of resources one might use. But I thought that it might be beneficial for us and for the listeners to actually kind of put it into practice a little bit in this last section of this episode. So I know you had mentioned in the previous section, Aaron, that you wanted to talk about Naboth's vineyard. I'll let you kind of start in on that and kind of explain how this method and how these resources would go actually, how you'd use them to teach this story. So where do you want to start? Sure. I picked Naboth's vineyard because it's you know obviously one of the stories that's in the Bible history. Well, it's just a good story that illustrates more than a few points from the Ten Commandments. It's you know a lot of times... You play the game, the exercise rather, of which of the Ten Commandments does this story have to do with? Which does this show so and so breaking? You know, like the the go to one a lot of times is David and Bathsheba. Well, he coveted, he committed adultery, and he murdered. You know, amid, among other things too, and everything of course goes back to the first commandment as well. Well, uh, Naboth's Vineyard is a good story because it, I think, it's just a memorable one. Hopefully, in the minds of our listeners and. Open the book and it fell to this one. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a good one to, <laughs> just to use. So what I do, 
I don't perfectly follow the outline for the class that the Bible Outlines does, but I do use it as, as the resource, especially when it comes to the summary questions. But when I teach a class, I will begin on one of the Bible stories, I will begin by giving a broad summary of the story. And when I do that, I'm giving them essentially what I want them to say to me at the end when I have them summarize the story back to me after we've done the entire class. So the story, the way that I summarize the story to the students before we really start anything is essentially saying, say this back to me, you know, in 30 minutes or whatever, however long it takes to tell that particular story, and I'll be happy. And it also (laughs) helps to highlight the major plots and themes that are in the story, because you get to, when you give the summary, you're giving the points that you really want them to remember about the story, uh, whether the historical details, persons, or what the person does. I do that just giving probably, it's maybe about three or four sentences. So like if in the case of Nabus Vineyard, I would tie it in with the fact that we've been talking about Elijah already in the stories preceding this and say it's during his time of the divided monarchy and it's in the Northern Kingdom, Israel, and it's with Ahab, the wicked king, who we've already seen at this point. And he sees a vineyard in Jezreel, this adjacent to his property that belongs to a man named Naboth. He sees Naboth's vineyard and, and he covets it. He wants to have this vineyard for himself. It's something that doesn't belong to him and he wants it for himself. And he has an evil wife named Jezebel who wants to help him acquire that vineyard. We have this coveting. And then with Jezebel, she convinces her husband to let her lie, saying that Naboth had blasphemed the Lord so that way uh, they could stone him to death, according to what we learned about in Leviticus for what happens to blasphemers. And so that happens. Two very bad men are in cahoots with Ahab and Jezebel. They lie about Naboth uh, and they have Naboth stoned to death. Ahab takes possession of Naboth's vineyard as his own. And then after this happens, he doesn't get away with it. The Lord sends the prophet Elijah to prophesy against him, saying that the Lord's going to execute judgment on him for what he had done. And sure enough, what Elijah says happens, happens. Ahab is killed in battle several years later. Then also his wife Jezebel, she is killed after Yehu comes onto the scene. So I give them that sort of a summary, usually a little more succinct succinct than that, try to be at least, because if you include too many details, then they're not really going to remember anything. At least a summary of, of what's going on, what happens. And if you can tie in the words from the catechism, those words too, because what you finally want is when they're thinking about the catechism, you know, devotionally or for their own self-examination years later, you want them to remember the story. Or when they hear or read the story, you want them to remember the catechism. The whole point is catechesis to tying God's word with the doctrines uh, of, of the small catechism. So once step done, one is done, once I've given them the summary, I'll go into step two, which is we read through the story together as it is in the Bible history out loud. It's usually paragraph by paragraph. and that might seem to be, I don't know, to some people it might seem to be a little overkill, but I do that for several reasons. Number one, you know, it's getting done. <laughs> you, right. <laughs> you know, you know, the student is actually reading it because if you just give it at home as homework, especially those of us out there, pastors and teachers, we know that a lot of times the homework doesn't get done. And so you're talking to somebody who, who doesn't have knowledge of the material that you're trying to cover. And you're, it, it's, it's difficult to teach that way. So when you read through it together, it's it's an active thing, thing, an interactive thing. It keeps the student engaged, and you know they're they're actually hearing it again, and it's fresh. You've just given them the summary. Now you're reading the story, but during this second step, while I'm reading it, I will interject my own comments. I will provide a commentary, and that commentary is based off of the things that I have read in the Bible history references, uh, one of the resources we just talked about. So for instance, in the story of, of Naboth, you have the, you know, it says, just says that they stoned him. Okay, so in the Bible history references, you look up you know, that part of it, the little list of parts from the story, and it says, according to Exodus 22, verse 28, a blasphemer was to be put to death. And it even gives the lesson previously in the Bible history, lesson 32, that you can go back and reference. So I might not say all of that, but like I said, I'll bring out, and I think I did this in the summary, so I really wouldn't do that in the summary, but I would do it now while we're reading it, where I'll say, you guys remember what 
was supposed to happen to blasphemers? Yeah, put to death. That's right. And so this is why they lie and say Naboth said this when he didn't. Or the other thing is when it says two men, like, you know, they went and found the, the two men of bad reputation. And in Bible history references says the Mosaic law in Deuteronomy 19 required that every matter at court be established at the mouth of at least two witnesses. So I don't bring up everything that the references says, but I try and bring up points like that that can be used to illustrate a point or make it make sense. Like, why did it have to be two men, they might ask. Or even later on when we get to the New Testament and you see the Pharisees bringing false witness against the Lord, you understand why it was such a thing to have these witnesses say what they said and how many it took and so forth. So I'll provide while we're reading together just the commentary, filling in some of the details or answering questions as they come up. Yeah, and even even with the Pharisees, the two false witnesses against Jesus could not agree in their testimony. So it really emphasizes how much of a sham Jesus' trial was. But that's kind of a, a side point. That's here. right. And ideally, when you're covering that story, or uh, even if they do it out of the order, they should think back to Naboth in the story of Naboth's vineyard when they're hearing about Jesus's trial. Like, yeah, this isn't the first time that's happened. False witness is awful. It can really do harm and damage to somebody. Although looking at some of the resources that you provided me for this show here too, like the talking about where Jezreel is and why that's so important is also, I think, a, a tremendous benefit of it being at the boundary of Issachar in the Valley of Jezreel. And there was a royal residence there. And and the fact that that was so well endowed and, and Ahab had all of these wonderful things at this palace, and yet he's not content with what he has. And I think you could make a lesson out of that as well. So Absolutely. One of the side points, it doesn't really come out in the Bible history, but I think it's there for the taking, is Jezebel is a lesson in marrying somebody outside of Israel. She right. was a Sidonian. And it's also a lesson, you know, you guys had the headship episode recently of following your wife's lead or letting her take the reins and wear the pants or the crown, as it were, in the case of, of Ahab. <laughs> and you can tie these things in, too. It's all it's all pertinent. It all uh, it all is, is uh, there for the teaching. And with Jezebel, too, of course, she can't believe that Ahab would just kind of sulk when he when somebody tells him no, because, you know, she she sees kingship as being like you do whatever you want. And so you could have a discourse on false ideas of what it means to be king, too. But that's that's kind of getting getting far afield here. But right. anyway, <laughs> she she saw the Mel Brooks movie. She did. <laughs> All right. So we've gotten through steps one and two then. So what would you, where would you go from there? What's, what's step three? Yeah, step three, I'd have them tell the story back to me. Now, of course, this is dependent on the size of class that you have. We have a relatively smaller church here. So my classes are smaller. We had three students this last year. So you can, you can do it around. You don't like take each student and have them tell you the story. You only have so much time, but I'll do it interactively. So like, okay, you know, first student, I'll, you know, have him give the first part, or I might even put it in the form of a question. Like, who is the king again? Uh, Ahab. Yeah. Right. And what was his wife's name? Jezebel. And what did Ahab want? So a lot of times this, this ends up being question and answer, quizzing them. But sometimes I will just say, can you summarize the story we just heard? Maybe you'll let one student do part of it or one student even do all of it. And a lot of times during this, I'll ask some questions from the history outline book. Like, for instance, for this story, it says, how did Jezebel try to make the taking of the property from Naboth appear right and lawful? You see what they say. And it gives you the answer, too. I mean, you, you know the answer already as the teacher, but it's nice to see what the book says. And the answer is, of course, by accusing him of blasphemy, which he had to be punished with death. So you get them to reason through what happened in the story and why it happened, why it unfolded. So, yeah, having having them summarize and asking them details, because even though when you ask them a question and even if they don't remember the answer or whatever, you're going to give the answer. Or one of the other students will give the answer. And again, it's just one more repetition of the detail, the point and the story that the whole the whole goal is trying to get them to learn the story. It's not to test their short term memory, per se. <laughs> So, so if you say it, if you have to say it again, that's fine because it's a new story generally, and you just say it, and then that's the step step three there. And then what what would be your step after that point? Some people might be kind of surprised, but you essentially have a, a third telling of the story, and that's where the woodcuts come in. I'm sorry, not a third, a fourth one, because you have your summary, 
You have reading the story with your commentary. You have them retelling the story. And then you close looking at a woodcut or a picture, a painting. If you can find, you can use any resource for this. Preferably, I I like the woodcuts because uh, back when they did these, they did a good job for a lot of them of including the whole story in a picture. For instance, I'm trying to think, okay, so, so when the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom split, what did Jeroboam set up in the Northern Kingdom to be a focal points for worship for the Israelites? Well, the two calves, of right, course. The, the two calves, right. And so in the woodcut, you have like, you have Jeroboam before Rehoboam and, you know, they're having the interaction. And in the background, you have one of the calves. Okay, so we know that this all didn't really happen at once and, you know, in one tight little space. That's that's beside the point. And the students get that, you know, because you just go around and you say, well, what's this right here? What do you see here? Oh, that's that's the calf. Yeah, that's the calf that, i get the name straight, Jeroboam set up to draw people away so they wouldn't have to go down to Jerusalem and Judah to worship. And you get them to explain the different parts and like, you know, who's this and what's going on here? And it's really great. I found the the pictures, the woodcuts to be pr- one of the better parts to bringing the students out and getting them involved in the class and invested in it. Because again, they're, they're, you're, you're sort of just having them retell the story again, but you're using something visual to capture their attention and interest because then it becomes almost a, it becomes a hunt for them to, to find the details in the story, the, the subtle little things here and there. And you you had mentioned too that you know this isn't just a, an exercise in short term recall, which you know if we go through the story just once and kind of have them recap that you know maybe it would be a case of just short term memory. But like one thing that I know that I've done with my students has been to try to to get them to see the general outline of scripture as well. So you know like right. what happens in what order. So it's not just a matter of, I remember only what I need for today, and then I go on and, you know, I don't have to remember it ever again. But this is something that is building. This is so that you can see the the whole picture of salvation history. Right. Which is something that I think that what you're suggesting is is doing. Because, you know, by helping them to review the story multiple times, even in the same sitting, is really going to drive home the point. Right. And and something I left out is a good way to start the class, even before you give the summary of the story you're going to look at, is you have them summarize the period that you're in. So the, the Bible histories divide both Testaments up into periods. So for instance, the Old Testament, the first period is primeval history, and it gives you know the years that, that covers. Second period is the patriarchs, time of the patriarchs. Third period is Moses and Joshua. Fourth, the judges. Fifth, you know, first three kings and so forth. And so each of those periods includes variable numbers of stories. And you've obviously been going through those stories as you've gone along in the year up until the point, and you can't summarize all of them. But what you can do is you can you can list them. So if you're doing, say, the curse of Canaan and the Tower of Babel, which is the last story of primeval history, you have six stories preceding it. Creation, man in paradise, fall of man, Cain and Abel, from Adam to Noah and the flood. Okay, so each one of those stories, you you don't want them to forget it or where the story you're at falls in the the greater narrative. So the more immediate the story, like you ha- you might have them summarize a few points from the week before. Like you start the class by saying, "Well, what happened last week? Last week was the flood. Can who can tell me what happened in the flood?" And then you do like the same thing where you ask them questions. But even before that, you might go all the way back and say, all right, first period primeval history, what happens first? Creation, that's right. And then after creation, what happened in the Garden of Eden? And they'll just say the fall of Adam. And you see, you let them summarize the story really just in giving the story's name. And if you do this enough consistently, just, you know, week after week, they'll remember, you know, broadly speaking, the general outline, you know, the periods that you're talking about themselves more specifically what happens inside of the period and even those individual stories what happens in them because again that's finally what you want you want them to be able to recall based off of a few key words or or something like that the general parts and then the particulars i think that's all great stuff and something definitely to consider for our listeners so we got a couple minutes left here in this segment so is there is there anything that you want to add kind of in closing uh, when we're talking about uh, yep. Bible histories and their importance? Yeah, another point. I mean, like I said, there's there's a lot of times in the Bible history outlines book encourages you to look at other Bible verses. And so, for instance, just with Naboth's Vineyard, it says you should look at Isaiah 5 and Proverbs 14. 
which of course have nothing to do with the story's narrative, but have to do with what we see on display in the story, you know, the, the moral as it were. So Isaiah 5 says, woe to those that join house to house who add field to field until there's no more room and you're made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. Or, you know, woe to those who call good evil and evil good, which seems to be, you know, it's like a little sermon against, you know, Ahab and Jezebel or Proverbs 4 talking about whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who's generous to the needy honors him. And, you know, and, and so forth, where these things serve, you know, you have the students look them up and it helps to remind them that, again, this, these aren't just stories. You're not just reading, what's the, what's the Tolkien book, The Cimmerillion, where it has all the details right. about, it's, it's not just that. I mean, this, this is about <laughs> our life as Christians and what that looks like, what we believe and what we do. And so it's all one big thing to be taken together to help aid in the formation of our Bible students to become good Christians. Oh, very good. Aaron, thanks for being on with us today. It's been a pleasure to have you back. So we look My forward pleasure. to having you in the future. I'll see you in about eight months or whenever you can nail me down again. <laughs> whenever we can get the deep fake going again. <laughs> This has been a Word Fitly Spoken. If you like what you heard, you can visit us at wordfitlyspoken.org, facebook.com slash wordfitly, or Twitter at wordfitly. I'm Zelwyn Heidi here with Aaron Upoff. God love you, and God bless. The teacher of religion will want to study not only the prophecies of the Messiah, but also the people whom God led and directed in so marvelous a manner. In Old Testament history, the teacher will find great men of God, characters whose lives remain to this day models for Christian virtues. Shall he ever grow weary of studying the faith of Abraham, the chastity of Joseph, the zeal for godly leadership exhibited by David? Shall he ever have learned completely the lessons that God teaches his followers of any age by the checkered loyalty of his people while they wandered through the wilderness or during the first centuries that they occupied the promised land of Canaan? Can Christians today be oblivious to the warning that God gives them and the idolatrous practices of Israel and Judah during the years following the reign of Solomon? Look where we will. We see everywhere the rich experience of a people who, on the one hand, carried the consciousness of their being the chosen race, but on the other, battled the same frailties and temptations and desires that today keep Christians from living as they should like to live. The Old Testament people record a succession of sin with its consequences and divine grace with its blessings, the story of which serves the Christian today as experience from which he may learn.